Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. years ago, I was working at a nursing home. I worked night shift with three to four other people. Each night, we were assigned a hall on which we did rounds every two hours and answered call lights as needed. In our downtime between rounds, we usually would sit in the dining hall, which was located right in the middle. For the first couple of months I worked there, nothing happened. I was a bit disappointed and said so one night between rounds. I'd been told detailed stories of things that had happened and was beginning to think people were doing just that – telling stories. When it was time to do rounds again that night, I moved from room to room without any trouble – until I got to the very last room. I checked on the patient and was moving toward the door when the bathroom door slammed shut quite loudly. I almost jumped right out of my shoes and, without reopening the door, ran out of the room. I went back in about half an hour later and found the bathroom door wide open again. Call lights would turn on in rooms with no patients staying in them. We'd go to check and find the room empty. They even called in an electrician to make sure there were no faulty wires as we have to log every call light. We would hear someone walking down the hall only to find no one out of bed. I recall one time I was in the laundry room by myself, switching clothes to the dryer, when I distinctly heard someone call my name. I thought it odd because it was a male voice and there were no males working that night. We would hear what sounded like large cans falling in the kitchen, yet when the cooks arrived in the morning, we would investigate only to find everything in order. I suppose the eeriest things that happened were on one ward where all the patients were on their deathbeds and they were moved so they could receive care around the clock. There were cold spots in many rooms, equipment would malfunction even after being thoroughly checked out, and voices could be heard. I remember one particular night where I was assigned to the bedside of a man who eventually passed away early the next morning. I had stepped out of the room for a moment to retrieve something, and when I returned, I was shocked to find a woman standing at the foot of the bed. There was no possible way that she could have entered the room without me seeing her. When I questioned her as to why she was in there, she just smiled at me and then disappeared before me. I also started to notice that there would be a constant whispering though you could never understand just what was being said. The place was alive with spirits, and I wouldn't return again. I now work elsewhere. Five years ago, 
I purchased a couple of 18th century houses built next to each other and surrounded by a lovely, mature garden. The houses are on the outskirts of a picturesque village called St. Dizier Larine, which is located in the Limousine region of France. I purchased the houses with the intention of letting out as rural holiday homes, and this is exactly what I have done. Soon after making my purchase, I spent some considerable time over one summer renovating both the properties, and it is during this time that I first had a rather strange thing happen. Whilst fitting a new window overlooking the garden, I noticed a man in overalls and a straw hat. He was apparently tending to the flowers and shrubs. Being intrigued, I promptly decided to go outside in order to ask what he was doing in my garden, but by the time I made my way through the cottage to the door, I could not see him anymore. I then walked around the perimeter of my garden, but there was nobody there. I did not think too much of this and put the experience down to the possibility of a trick of the light and the fact that I was quite fatigued working for many weeks without much rest. Some more weeks passed and I needed the help of a local tradesman. A friend gave me the telephone number of a tradesman she had recently hired and could recommend him for doing a good job. So I telephoned him and arranged for him to call around on a Tuesday morning. I woke up on the arranged date to the sound of songbirds in the garden, just as many other mornings. I looked out of one of the newly installed windows, but this time I saw what looked like a man in overalls and a straw hat again. I was not sure if this could be the tradesman or not, so I opened the window and called out to him, but with no success. He did not respond to me. I then went to my door and opened it, but yet again he had disappeared. I began to remember the similarity to the previous sighting of the man in the garden, and just at that moment my telephone rang. It was the tradesman calling to say he would be arriving soon. So I then realized the man I saw in the garden could not have been him. At this point I was feeling a little hungry and decided to pop out to the local bakery to get a baguette. I was only gone for maybe ten minutes and on my return resumed my work for the morning, anticipating the arrival of the tradesman, but my midday had not turned up. The rest of the day went well and I finished my work, but still the tradesman had not turned up, so I decided to call him and ask why. When he answered the telephone, he sounded a little confused. He said that he had called round and spoken to me in the garden. I replied, no way, I was at home all day other than for briefly going out to the bakery at 10 a.m. He then promptly replied that he had definitely spoken to me at approximately 10 a.m. in my garden. This left me very puzzled, and because we had never met before, I asked him to describe who he had spoken to. He then went on to describe a man in overalls and a straw hat tending to the garden. At this point, I got a shiver down my spine. I asked, did he speak to this man? He said yes. The man in overalls and hat said he was the owner of the property and did not require the services of a tradesman. This left me a little distressed and rather concerned as to what was going on. I asked the tradesman to come around the next day in order to get to the bottom of all this. Next day, the tradesman did indeed arrive, and when I greeted him, he was rather shocked and said to me, you are not the man I spoke to yesterday. I replied to him, obviously not, and informed him that I was the owner of the properties and that I had previously cited the figure of a man in overalls and straw hat in my garden. Both I and the tradesman shrugged our shoulders and did not know what to make of it all. Nevertheless, I hired the tradesman to help install a modern bathroom in one of my cottages. We worked well together and struck up a friendship. After working together for a few days, we had to move an old box out of the attic in the cottage. We noticed it had some contents, so we looked inside. Amongst various articles, we spotted an old straw hat and a sepia photo of the man we had both seen. On the reverse of the photo, there was an inscription stating a date, 1899. We both then realized we had seen a ghost in my garden. It was a chilling feeling, but also a realization that we had solved the mystery. The man had obviously been a previous owner of the properties. 
Eventually, all of the renovations had been completed. I began to successfully let out the houses as holiday accommodation. But to my surprise, more than one or two of my guests have asked about the mysterious gardener, the man in overalls and straw hat tending to the garden. When this took place, I was five years old or maybe a little younger. Surrounded by my toys, I played in the living room alone, as I often did. On this day, I remember it was raining and gray, and I was playing with my game of toy fishing instead of the garden, which was my usual haunt. It was a simple toy which included a circular dish which would be filled with plastic fish and tiny fishing rods with magnets attached to the end. The aim was simply to catch a fish with the magnet on the rod. It was meant for two people or more, but often I played it by myself. As I caught more and more fish, I placed them on the carpet beside me, stacking them neatly as I angled for the last few remaining fish. This was when I saw it. A hand. A human hand which darted from behind the sofa and snatched up one of my plastic fish from my pile. It happened so quickly that it took me a while to react. Yet, as quick as it had happened, I knew what I had seen as I also knew that I was completely alone in that room. It took my mother entering the room before I drew up the courage to follow my fish, but as I peered around the back of the sofa, I knew it would not be there. And it wasn't. It had gone, and after searching and searching, I never found it again even though I always kept an eye out for that small plastic fish. I never told my parents. I've never told anyone this incident. I'm not sure why, as I often thought of it over the years. I worked for a development company that had purchased an entire neighborhood of Victorian homes to renovate and resell. Every home for a two-block radius was empty, except for the one that I lived in, which was near completion and was going to be used as the model home. One afternoon, I was almost out of cigarettes and decided to walk to a corner store a few blocks away. Keep in mind that this was an out-of-the-way neighborhood. There were no workmen around, all of the homes were vacant, and the entire area was deserted. I had only walked about one block and was looking down at the sidewalk lost in thought when a few feet ahead of me I heard a voice say, excuse me, but may I have a cigarette? Before I even looked up, I was astonished that anybody was even around, but what I saw astonished me even more. Standing there was an elderly black lady. She was small and frail and dressed head to toe in black. Her dress was high-necked and went down to the ground. She had on a small pillbox hat with a veil hanging from it covering her face. I was absolutely speechless but managed to say, certainly, as I offered a cigarette to her outstretched hand. I lit my lighter and she lifted the veil to reveal an oval face extensively wrinkled and old. Her eyes focused only on the flame as she bent forward to light the cigarette, and as she inhaled it, she said, Oh, thank you. This is so good. I turned away to continue my walk when it occurred to me that I still had a few cigarettes left in my pack. Being that I was going to buy more, I turned back to her in order to give her the few I had left. There was nobody there. Did I run into the ghost of a lady who once lived in these old houses? This story takes place in Manchester, United Kingdom. 
It happened when I was a child, around six years old, so 1986. I was at the family home with my mom, dad, and older brother Paul. Paul and I used to share a bunk bed, with him on bottom and me on the top. I used to sleep with a clip-on lamp on my right-hand side. One night, I awoke to a tapping on my shoulder. Fast taps, one, two, three. It woke me almost immediately, so I turned on the lamp to see why my brother was harassing me at this time of the night. When I looked down, he was asleep. Or pretending, I thought. Growing up, we were always playing pranks on each other. I turned off my light and lay there. One minute later, the tapping started again. The same as before. Fast. One, two, three. I turned my lamp on again, looking down at my brother. Still in the same position and asleep. Stop it, I said. But he didn't even move. Once again, light back off, but this time the tapping was straight away and consistent. I turned the light back on almost as quick as I could and looked back down at Paul, realizing he would not have had the time to get back to his bed. A bit freaked out, I turned off the light but kept my hand on the switch. As soon as it went off, tap, straight back on, nothing around me. I turned it off again, tap, tap, tap. This time, I turned the light back on to see nothing, and I leaped clean off the bunk and dashed down the hall to my mom and dad's room, where I spent the rest of the night. I have been a first responder for many years. Some very strange things have happened but nothing like this one situation I found myself in. I was called out to a situation one evening. I arrived and spoke to a middle-aged lady who told me that her son was under the influence of a drug. She didn't know what drug he had taken, but apparently he had been babbling and acting in a very strange way. He had told her that he was scared to go to his room because an old man was hanging above his bed. She said that she had not checked out his claim as she was too scared to go into his room. She did tell me that he was constantly bringing friends over who were known drug addicts, but said that she hadn't known until that night that he was taking them too. I went to speak with the son who was clearly under the influence of a substance. He told me that he was told by a spirit to not enter the bedroom because her father dressed in his military Class A uniform, was hanging from the ceiling of his bedroom. I checked the room and of course there was no body hanging in the room. As I'm in the middle of explaining to the mother that there was no body in the bedroom, a veteran officer arrives on scene to assist me. He pulls me aside and told me that a few years earlier he had been called to this residence and directed to that same bedroom. He had to investigate a suicide by hanging of an older male subject. He didn't remember all the details, so I looked it up in our report management system in my patrol car, and sure enough, the officer was correct. The subject who died was a veteran of the Second World War and had dressed in his military uniform and had been depressed. He had hung himself. When I was seven years old, I used to be scared of going into my school bathroom alone. This is because every time I was in there by myself, I would see a young girl standing in the shower. She wore a gray school skirt, long white socks, black shoes, white polo shirt, and a jumper. I tried ignoring her for about half a year as I thought I was going mad because nobody else saw it, but she never moved. I spoke to my mom about it, I was so scared even though the young girl hadn't moved, and my mom told me to talk to the ghost. I did talk to her and I asked her to leave me alone, but she did nothing. I saw her constantly throughout my time at that school. A few years later, I then found out that a girl had passed away at my school. 
I'm not too sure how. All I could find out is that her first name was Rhea. I continued seeing her until I left that school, and there was nothing I could do about it. I am now really interested in the paranormal, even though it still does scare me to think about it. This happened in the early 80s. I was getting married for the first time. My wedding was to be in Las Vegas, so my fiancé and I drove up and were traveling on the freeway to Vegas. This happened on that freeway during our journey to Vegas. We were coasting along talking about the wedding when we both noticed something white start to cross the freeway in front of us. This figure was actually floating and I honestly thought it was a piece of paper. I continued talking to my fiancé but kept my eye on this thing when finally we got right up to it and almost ran it over. At exactly the same time we screamed, what the hell is that? What we saw was a miniature devil with horns running across the road in front of us. I saw this thing clearly and it was no animal. It was white, had two arms, two legs, a tail and a pointy human head and face with two horns. It ran on two legs, not on four. We had to have been traveling at least 70 miles per hour when this thing crossed in front of us and I can verify that it was actually floating. When we got back home, I tried to find out more about that stretch of desert to see if maybe it could have been an animal, but I found nothing. And besides, I know it wasn't. Just a devil-shaped humanoid that was white, not red. It was not furry, and I believe it was demonic. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? Weird Darkness continues in just a moment. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. I swear this house is alive and trying to kill me. You might call me mad, but there is something evil here that is after me. I tell you it's the truth. I rented this secluded Victorian house a few days ago. I being a writer of sorts. Most of you only know me by my many stories that appear in the so-called pulps, as many have branded them. I get paid a meager wage to churn out stories about the unusual and bizarre. I never thought I would be living it, though. 
The sheer terror that grips my every moment is beyond anything I have ever witnessed or written about. I was feeling that I needed a change from my current city dwellings. Living in a small cramped apartment in the bustling city is no fun indeed, especially as it is such a stifling summer and the heat is so unbearable. I decided to check the local listings for a summer rental. I had managed to save some money back from my meager earnings over the course of the last two years. I also have a small inheritance set aside. I quickly found a listing for a Victorian house that had been built in the 1850s. I was so excited to see it. I promptly phoned the property owner. I was so entranced with the place as soon as we pulled up to it. I stepped out of the taxi, telling the driver to please wait for a moment. Then I saw the owner on the front porch. It was a magnificent structure, three stories with a massive turret room on one side. It was built upon a small hill, a really imposing house of character. I was instantly seized with a rush of adrenaline. This is a house where I could write a masterpiece, I said to myself. I approached the steps and started up them as the owner spoke to me. Mr. Woodcraft, I presume? Yes, I'm Vincent Phillips Woodcraft, and you are Mr. Smith, the owner. Correction, good sir, I represent the owners, said Mr. Smith in his slightly clipped northeastern accent. We toured the many rooms. It was a grand old house. Many furnishings were already there, having been draped in white sheets. The drawing room and study were breathtaking. We soon made our way upstairs to the second and third floors. Ah, the turret room, said Mr. Smith. Yes, that would be a fine room for my writing. I have to ask, Mr. Woodcraft, is there a Mrs. Woodcraft and possibly a few children joining you? Uh, no, Mr. Smith, I'm a bachelor. A bachelor, exclaimed Mr. Smith. You're going to stay here all summer by yourself? Well, you see, I've been living in a cramped apartment and the city is so crowded. What with this heat wave, I felt I needed to escape for a few months. I readily welcome a vast living area to be in for a while. Oh, I see, said Mr. Smith. Then you wish to rent it for the summer? Oh, yes, Mr. Smith, I exclaimed. May I ask why the rent is so reasonable? Not that I'm complaining. Sir, it is correct. You see, the family is quite wealthy, and since this house is in a less desirable area, as most people these days prefer to be closer to the newer summer attractions, this is the reason they're offering it at a reduced rate. I signed the paperwork and made the down payment, shaking hands with Mr. Smith and bidding him a goodbye. I rushed to the taxi, gathering my belongings and headed back into the house. The first night went well. The house is wired for electricity, though the lights and fixtures are minimal. I do have several kerosene lanterns that I can use, if need be. The house is located near the lake, and a river is also nearby. There are many trees on the property, and I don't have a neighbor close by. Perfect for me. I need to write that novel I've been wanting to work on for so long. I'm trying to pull myself up from the pulps and get ahead in the writing field. I still have a couple of assignments I'm working on, one about an ancient creature born of the sea that comes out in the night killing people, and the other is about a book that has black magic powers written by a mad Arab magician. Really horrendous material. Oh well, it's a living. Things seem to be going wonderfully. That is, until the dreams started. Oh, those wretched nightmares. The visions I saw of the people in the house being tortured and murdered. How the house seemed to gain power from it. I've been writing these cheap stories of terror for far too long, I thought. It's making me develop a psychosis. Brushing all ill thoughts aside, I started to plan my novel. A rich American classic full of unique characters and plots. Maybe a romantic epic or deep mystery? Could I pull off a book like that of a Hemingway or Fitzgerald? Who knows, but I must try. Tomorrow is a new day. The morning went well. 
I got up early and worked for two hours. I then ate a very small breakfast. I then continued to work on my notes and outline. Looking at my watch, it was almost noon, I decided to go downstairs to fix lunch. I left the turret room, walking the stairs to second floor hall which had a railing and it was there that I tripped, barely catching myself before I went over the second story railing, scaring me for a moment looking down and that's when I saw a flash or vision of a young girl falling to her death. It was just a second or two. I then made my way down the stairs to the kitchen. Later that evening, I was in the study, examining some of the great volumes on the shelves when I heard a loud scratching noise in the walls. Startling me, I quickly examined the area, seeing no openings. The thought of rats infesting the house was a little unnerving, to say the least. I decided to draw a bath, and while in the bathtub on the second floor, I had the most fearful event yet. I was relaxing in the warm water when I must have slightly dozed off and the next thing I know, I'm underwater and I can't get my head above the top of the tub with my hands grabbing the cool porcelain. I found I could not expel myself from the grip of whatever had me in its grasp. I pushed with my feet as well. Suddenly I sprang forth, heaving in huge gasps of air. I sprinted from the tub and quickly made my way to my bedroom. I was shaking uncontrollably. I had to leave this evil, godforsaken place no matter what. It being night and I had no phone to call anyone, I eventually calmed myself enough to take a nap. I slept peacefully for a while, but then the horrible dreams started. Those peculiar, grotesque nightmares of an antiquated time and place, ancient beings chanting loudly. Soon I saw myself tied to an altar in some secret chamber. I tried furiously to free myself from my bonds, but to no avail, and then suddenly, without warning, the thrust of a dagger in my side. Feeling the excruciating pain, I awakened, screaming as I bolted from bed. Wide awake and still feeling the grip of fear, I gathered my clothes and dressing as fast as possible. I ran along the hallway to the stairs and I was tripped, but this time it was far worse. I tumbled, smacking my leg on a step, and then I heard the unnerving noise of a snapping bone in my left wrist. The pain was unbearable. I came to rest finally at the bottom of the stairway. I had no way to get help, and it was difficult to move. I think my back was also broken, or at least out of place. Here I lie, hopeless in the darkness of this beast of a house with many thoughts rushing through my mind. The one thought was how I was going to get out of this ordeal alive. That was the one burning question I clung to in the still of the lurking evil. When I was 17, I joined the army right after I had graduated high school. It was something I had planned to do as I knew I wasn't a good student and college was not the place for me. After three days of basic training, Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Training was instantly accelerated. Upon completion of training, I was assigned to my duty station and unit. It was there where I met Brian. He was my roommate in the barracks. He was a wiry kid, same age as me. He was from the Quad Cities, Iowa area, I was from Chicago, we got along great. This would be essential later in our military experience. Brian was more than a little bit wild, which sometimes got us both into trouble. I say both because I was usually nearby Brian most of the time. We would go to bars in town, the ones we knew we could get into without being carted, and had great times there. More than once, I had to separate Brian from some goon who said Brian was hitting on his girlfriend. Granted, he probably was, but if we caused trouble in a bar that let us drink there despite our age, we certainly wouldn't be welcome there anymore. Quite often, I had to keep Brian in check. He would complain and argue, but deep down, he appreciated it. Our unit was constantly on alert due to the war going on in the Middle East. 
We always thought that we would never get called up, but one morning that call came to our unit. Brian and I were ready, but still never thought we would really be off to the combat zone. We all made the jokes and postured with machismo, but deep down, most of us were nothing more than scared teenagers, Brian and I included. We were assigned to a combat patrol near the outskirts of Baghdad. The heaviest part of the fighting was mostly over, but there were several pockets of resistance by the Royal Guard. There were Hussein's most loyal soldiers. They had ditched their uniforms and taken to fighting by hiding in civilian areas. These opponents were no laughing matter. They were in their own element and knew every hiding place. They were also protected by the locals, not out of loyalty, but out of fear. The locals knew better than to oppose them. It was an instant death sentence if they did. But the civilian populace feared us as well, mostly because they weren't sure about why we were there, in their streets, in their shops and markets, even in their homes. The main reason we would be in their homes is because that's where the Royal Guard liked to hide. They'd stash weapons everywhere they could, mostly in private homes. Anyone who resisted ended up dead, or worse, tortured to death. We were here to put an end to that. On this patrol, Brian and I were sent to check out a small house that was a known weapons stash. Our intel people had bribed a young boy with candy to get this information. We called these candy calls. They were usually reliable, but sometimes we came upon the unexpected. We entered the home politely but sternly. We didn't want to scare any of the women or children, but if there were any men present, we wanted them to know we meant business. We weren't taking any chances. We went to work searching the usual stash spots, under beds and furniture, cupboards and closets. We came to a small room, a child's bedroom it appeared, with a young girl present in it. She looked at us with fear in her eyes. She didn't move, she didn't speak, she just watched us as we moved about her room. I tried to give her a reassuring look, but it didn't seem to do any good. Something about her tripped my senses. Something was wrong here. She was even more nervous than most of the civilians we'd encountered. Her nervousness made me nervous. We knew better than to trust anybody here, but a little girl? How was she going to hurt us? Brian was moving toward the closet door at the back of the room as I was keeping an eye on the little girl. I could see her anxiety increase as Brian reached to open the door. I quickly turned and in a hushed but firm tone told Brian, stop, do not open that door. Brian turned and looked at me like I was nuts. What? He exclaimed. Something's wrong. I don't know what, but it ain't right in here. I pushed Brian aside and moved toward the closet door. Keep an eye on her, I said. She knows something, but I'm not sure what. Make sure she doesn't do anything crazy. We're not going home in bags because of some little girl, I hissed as I examined the door. There was really nothing unusual about it. I looked around the knob and the frame. Nothing. Then I caught a small glint near the latch. There it was, a small thin wire. I knew exactly what it was right away. The slightest tug on that door, the whole room and everyone in it would be blown to bits. That's when I realized why that little girl was in there. They were trying to throw us off by using her as a shield. The Americans won't harm a child, they thought. They could hide their weapons under a child. I couldn't believe it. Brian breathed a sigh of pure relief when I pointed the tiny wire out to him. Damn, brother! I owe you my life. If I opened that door, kaboom, that would have been the end of both of us. I just smiled and said, I've got you, brother. I've always got you. Yeah, Brian said with disbelief. You always have. Thanks, man. We reported our findings and went about the rest of the day. We got the word from the ordnance crew who went in to defuse our find as to what exactly was behind that door. It was an entry to a secret passage. On the door connected to that tiny wire, they found enough explosives to stop a tank. Inside were tons of weapons, ammo, and more explosives. Ordnance took all the credit, but Brian and I were proud of ourselves. 
We finished out our tour without any major instances. We were going home and glad of it. Before we took off, Brian thanked me again for not letting him open that door. Don't sweat it, I said, as we hopped aboard the plane and headed back for the States. Back at our stateside duty station, Brian and I tore it up in town. We were back, we were alive, and we wanted to celebrate. We went directly to the bar we usually hung out in. There was always a good time there. The waitress knew us and were glad to see us. They took good care of us. They were nice girls. Back at our post, Brian and I finished our enlistments. I got out before Brian due to some extra duty time he had incurred involving an officer that couldn't stop in time before it went south. That, however, is a story for another time. I told Brian to look me up when he got home. It would only be a few months before he was out. He called me when he got back to Iowa. We talked and laughed about our times in the Army. Brian reminded me that he still owed me his life. I said, don't be foolish. We got out of there. We're both alive. It's over. He wouldn't relent, so I let him have his way. Life went on from there. I didn't really see or hear from Brian much as the years went on. We both had our own lives to live. I got into welding and eventually got hired as a shop foreman. The last I knew about Brian, he was selling vacuum cleaners back in Iowa. Being the foreman, I was responsible for the material purchases for the shop. Welding supplies, metals, gases were all part of my duties. I got a page over the shop intercom from the receptionist up front. There was a call for me. She said it was a salesman from a welding supply company. I answered the call. Hey, the man said. I'd like to talk to you about your welding supply needs. Can I stop by your shop to get a feel of what you might need and what I can do for you? Sure. I said, trying to get this guy off the phone. I was busy and needed to get back to work. The next day, I got another page from the office. I picked up the phone and asked the receptionist what was up. Your welding supply guy is here, she said. I went to the office to meet this guy. I was kind of pissed off as I wasn't expecting him and there was a lot to do in the shop. His back was to me as I walked into the office. He was flirting with our receptionist. What can I do for you? I growled at him. As he turned to face me, a wave of shock came over me. It was Brian. It had been over ten years since I had seen him. Brian! I shouted as he reached to shake my hand. You're still a crabby old bastard, aren't you? He said. What are you doing here? I asked. Selling welding supplies. What does it look like? He replied. I took him out and showed him around the shop. He asked if I had time for lunch. I lied and said I did. The hell with the shop. It'd be there when I got back. We caught up with each other's lives and talked for quite some time. Brian was surprised to hear that I was married and had a young son already. How old is he? Brian inquired. Six, I said with a chest full of pride. He's the greatest thing in my life. Brian informed me that he was doing well, despite a few failed relationships with girls he had met in Iowa. I could tell he was lying. He was sad things weren't going as well for him. We finished lunch, and he brought me back to the shop. Before I went back in, we shook hands, and again he reminded me that he still owed me for what happened in Iraq. I smiled back and told him, At this point in my life, I hope you don't get the chance. We're even. Don't sweat it. All right, he said as he smiled and got back into his car. I couldn't convince my boss to take Brian up on the price quote he offered. Our present supplier was a schmoozer who took the boss to golf outings and elaborate dinners. Brian just couldn't compete with that. It's just the way it was going to be. Several years later, I received an envelope in the mail. It was a small, nondescript envelope. Inside was a newspaper story and a clipping from the obituary page. Nothing else, no note, no letter, just the article and the clipping. It was Brian's. He was killed in an accident back in Iowa. He had stopped on the side of the road to help someone with a flat tire. Apparently, he was returning to his car when a truck driver ran off the road and onto the shoulder where Brian was walking. He was killed instantly. I called the funeral home that was listed at the bottom of the clipping. I was informed that the obituary I received was more than three months old. Brian had been interred already. I missed it. 
I asked the man from the funeral home if he knew where Brian was buried. He gave me the name of the cemetery but told me he wasn't sure where it was. I drove out as soon as I had a chance. Iowa wasn't too far. I could make it there and back within the day. As I was walking out the door, my son asked where I was going. To see an old friend, I said. Can I go with you? He asked. I looked at him for a second and said, sure, why not? I could use the company. My son was 15 now. We talked some small talk as we drove to Iowa. I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him as I was usually working, sometimes some extremely long hours. How's school going? I inquired of the boy. Fine, he said with some disdain in his voice. Don't like school that much, huh? I said. He just looked at me, not wanting to disappoint me. I know, I said. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. What do you mean? He asked. You're just like your old man. I didn't care much for school either when I was your age, but take it from me, you don't have to like it, just get the most out of it that you can. If I had done that when I was your age, I probably wouldn't be spending so much time at work like I do now. Learn all you can, be better than I was, don't miss your chance. I could see that he wasn't really interested in talking about school, so I changed the subject. What else is going on with you? I asked him. Well he said. My friends are planning a camping trip this summer. Up at the state park, you know? Sure, I said. That's a great place. Sounds like fun. So can I go? He asked excitedly. Why not? I said. You'll have a blast. Cool, he said as he relaxed in his seat. Shortly after that, the GPS unit informed me that our destination was on the right. The cemetery. We were there. I drove up to the caretaker's office. I inquired about the location of Brian's grave. Hmm, said the old man. Yes, I remember. Small service it was. Just a preacher and a few fellas from the VFW. Shame what happened to that man. No family to bury him. No friends. Nothing. Ugh, I thought to myself. This guy was just twisting the knife in my heart. I already felt terrible for not staying in contact with Brian, this just made it that much more painful. Right, here you go, the old man yelped. Plot 5, row 128, far back end of the cemetery. He pointed his crooked old finger in the direction of the small cemetery road to where Brian was buried. We drove up to the site and got out to find the grave. It was a dingy area of the cemetery. An ancient tractor was rotting away against the fence, along with some old tools and an out-of-control brush pile. A disappointing place, to say the least. The old man had informed me that the VFW paid for the plot. It was all they could afford with what they had collected. The headstone was paid for by the government, a typical thing that is done for veterans. Plain as it was, it listed Brian's birth and death date and his service. U.S. Army Operation Desert Storm. My son stood a few steps back as I said goodbye to my friend. I bent down close to the stone and said, We're even, brother. With that, I returned to the truck and drove home. The return trip was silent. I didn't feel much like talking, and my boy respected that. A few weeks later, the time had come for my son to go on his trip with his friends. Are you sure he'll be all right? My wife asked as he pulled away with his friends. Of course. I said. The several older boys going, and they're all pretty responsible. He'll be fine. The boys had been gone for a few days. My wife and I were sitting down to dinner. The phone rang. She got up to answer it. What? What? She yelled into the phone. What happened? Are you all right? Did anyone else get hurt? She said, with anxiety building in her voice. I started to get nervous, the kind of nervousness I hadn't experienced since Iraq. My body started to tingle. I knew it was my son. My mind raced. What could have happened? Was he okay? What was going on? Okay, I heard her say into the phone. He's right here, she said, and she handed me the phone. Hello, I said with telltale nervousness in my voice. What happened? What's going on? It was my son on the other end. I was relieved to hear his voice as he filled me in on what had happened. 
The boys were rafting on the river and things got a little rough. He was thrown from the raft into the water. He'd hit his head on a rock and was separated from the other boys. Can you come and get me? He said. He was all right, but he just wanted to be at home. Understandable, I said to myself. Sure, I told him. I'll be there in a few hours. I raced up to the state park to get my son. I talked with some of the other boys and they told me how amazing it was that he was okay. The water was really moving, one boy said. Yeah, said another, probably because of all the rain from up north. It was pretty rough. I was just glad he was okay. We put his gear in the back, got in the truck, and headed for home. He noticed that I kept looking over at him. What, Dad? he asked, somewhat annoyed. Just checking, I said. I'm glad you're all right. Your guardian angel must have had you this time. You know, Dad, he said, that's funny you should say that. Why? I asked. Because, he replied, the guys said they could see me even though we were separated. They say I hit my head on a rock and they thought I was unconscious. Then they said they could see me moving toward the bank of the river, but I wasn't really swimming, just moving toward the bank. When they got to me, they said I was out cold. Really? I said with amazement. I'm just glad it turned out all right. One other thing, Dad, he said. What? I asked him. Well, he said with some hesitation, never mind, it doesn't matter. Okay, I said. Get some rest. We'll be home soon. I brought him home, and his mother was glad to see him. I smirked as she fawned all over him. I left her to it and started to get ready for bed. For some reason, Brian had been on my mind. I pulled out an old photo album from my army days. I was looking for a picture of Brian and I when we were in Iraq. Turning the pages, I found it, but it seemed as though someone had been into my stuff. When I looked at the picture, it had a water stain on it, like someone had spilled something on it. The color was running. I was a little angry. Who had been into my stuff? I grumbled. I could see the image of myself clearly, but the spot where Brian was in the picture was ruined. I was heartbroken. But that quickly changed as I looked closer at the ink running down the photo. It appeared to form some writing. A word. A single word, it seemed. I looked closer, and now I could see it clearly. The word the ink had formed. Even. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.